Good morning, everyone. Welcome back from, from break. Sorry that you have to come back to the test tonight after uh, fall break. But hopefully we're getting ready for the next three chapters for our exam tonight. Uh, we have one more problem from chapter five to review, then we'll get into some chapter six problems, and after that, into some chapter four. And so this problem here is um, talking about CH4 reacting with Cl2 to produce CH3Cl and HCl and gives us some bond strengths. The key with bond strengths is they allow us to approximate our delta H, our delta H of reaction. And this is an approximation method by taking the sum of the bond strengths that we break in the reactants. And then we subtract the bond strengths of those of the products. So this is kind of a weird one where it's products minus reactants, but we're trying to just figure out the problem of how much heat does it take to break the bonds in the reactants, and then how much heat do we get back when we make the new bonds in the products. So all bond enthalpies are positive, meaning if we're going to break one of these bonds, it takes energy to break the bond, and then we get energy back when we make a new bond. So we're here breaking a CH bond, and we're replacing it with a CCL bond, and we're also breaking a CLCL bond, and replacing that with an HCl bond. So we're breaking here. So the way I would approximate my delta H is by taking the broken bonds. Now, we could break all four CH bonds. There's nothing really wrong with that per se. We could break all the bonds in the reactants and then make all the bonds in the products. Or we could just identify that only this one bond here is broken and these other three remain the same and are unchanged. So if I do the 413 kJs per mole, for one of those bonds, I can either multiply it by one mole of the bonds that's net being broken, or I can multiply by four and then later subtract three moles times that value. So I'm just gonna break the one, and I'm gonna break the CLCL bond. So I have to break an entire mole of the bond. The CLCL bond's 242. And so it takes 413 plus 242 kJs per mole to break the bonds and the reactants that we need to break. Then I need to, then I need to subtract the sum of the bonds that I'm forming. I'm forming a 328. And then I'm forming a 431. So the mole unit cancels. Delta H's of reaction are usually in just units of kJs, where the moles are understood to be whatever the moles are from the coefficients in the reaction. And so if I do 413 plus 242, it takes 655 kJs to break the bonds in the reactants. And then I'm getting back 328 plus 431 forming a bond from its element fragments, and that should be exothermic. That's why we have the minus sign out in front here. So minus 328 plus 431, that's minus 759 kJs. So that's the energy we're getting back when we make the new bonds. One of the things that this problem lets us see is that uh, an enthalpy of reaction is exothermic. Like this reaction ends up being net exothermic, 655 minus 759 works out to be minus 104. KJs, that a reaction is exothermic when we're making stronger bonds. When we make bonds that are harder to break than those that we start with, we have an exothermic reaction. And if we're going to produce weaker bonds, if we imagine just the flip of this reaction being then endothermic, if we were to flip the chemical reaction, it would be endothermic because we'd have to break stronger bonds and we'd be forming weaker bonds in the process. So let's just see kind of why a reaction is exothermic versus endothermic has all to do with the relative strengths of the bonds and the reactants versus the products. OK. So let's move into chapter 6. So with chapter 6, we do get a few equations on the test. So I'll try to mention which of those equations you get. You've probably seen the equation sheet that I sent out last week. You get the speed of light, C is equal to lambda nu. This lets us calculate wavelength and frequency uh, relative to each other. E is equal to H nu. I think this one was on there. Um, this is the energy of a photon. Um, we could also write this as HC over lambda. Um, so those are useful equations to relate the energy of a photon to its wavelength or frequency. Uh, then you have the energy as a function of N for the hydrogen atom. This is from the Bohr model. This equation is also given on the test. 
where the minus hc times the Rydberg constant is equal to minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules times 1 over the n value squared. And this equation works for the H atom. And so this is for the Bohr model. If you remember, the Bohr model was the one where we had the electron spinning in like fixed orbits around the nucleus. And so the n equals 1 to n equals 2 to n equals 3 was just increasing the size of the orbit of that electron around the nucleus. Uh, these equations here, I don't think were given. I can't actually, these, I, these might have been given. Um, lambda is equal to h over mv. That's the de Broglie wavelength. So this is the wavelength of matter as a function of its uh, mass and velocity. And so this allowed us to calculate um, the natural wavelength that a particle would have. And this became most important for the electron. Um, and so, um, so that's the de Broglie wavelength equation. The uncertainty principle equation is this one here. The uncertainty in position is delta x. The uncertainty in velocity is uh, delta v. You, uh, we often use this expression here as delta x times m delta v, since mass is usually a constant, greater than or equal to h over 4 pi. So this is just getting at the uncertainty in the position and velocity of an electron. This, along with the wave-like behavior of an electron, led into the concept of orbitals um, and probability distributions using quantum mechanics. And so um, that's just a quick summary of some of the equations from chapter six. The, remember for chapter five, practically speaking, no equations on the test from chapter five. Chapter six, you do get a couple of equations. Uh, check the email I sent out for um, a specific, you know, and that's the actual sample um, um, paper booklet that you're gonna get with the exam so you can see exactly what equations you'll have on the exam. Okay, so let's look at a couple chapter six question, questions here. So a photon of light in which region of the electro electromagnetic spectrum would contain the greatest energy. And so from these regions here, radio frequency is the lowest energy. And really what I would probably remember is the, the range. That we go from gamma ray is greater than x-ray, is greater than UV, which is greater than visible. And visible is probably the only one where I would recommend knowing that it's 400 to 750 nanometers. And then this would be the blue side and this would be the red side of the spectrum. And then from the lower energy side, we'd have then the, uh, wrong direction, we'd have the infrared, then the microwave, and then the radio frequency being the lowest. And so the choices in number one, the ultraviolet would be the highest energy. So I wouldn't worry too much about specific wavelength cutoffs for the other regions, just um, knowing the general order. And maybe just knowing that infrared is the, the next lower. So if you're relatively close to 750, but a little higher, that's going to be in the infrared region. So if a metal requires seven, uh, excuse me, 455 kJs per mole to remove an electron, what wavelength of light in nanometers would be required to cause this ejection according to the photoelectron effect? So the photoelectric effect is just the idea that one photon interacts with one atom or one piece of matter to cause one event to take place, such as the ejection of an electron through ionization. And so if we're looking at the choices, do we want to use a 455 nanometer photon? Well, probably not. You know, that probably doesn't seem like that would be the precise wavelength. It's probably going to be 263, but to work through and see for sure, what we'd want to do is calculate or convert this energy here for just one atom instead of kJs per mole. So we want to go the number of joules for just one atom, and we take the 455 kJs per mole, and use Avogadro's number to go to just one, um, one atom. If we want to get rid of the atom, we'll just multiply by one atom because we want the energy just one single atom. So that's how the atom goes away, the mole dropped away. And then we'll just do a kJ thousand joules because we're going to probably use Planck's constant, which is joules times seconds. So we're going to go ahead and convert over to joules. So we'll use a thousand joules here. And so 455 divided by Avogadro's number times 1,000 
is 7.56 times 10 to the minus 19. Joules. And then when that's equal to hc over lambda, and we can solve for the wavelength associated with this energy, we're going to want to use a wavelength of that precise energy or greater energy. And so let's just calculate the wavelength real quick. So the lambda. And, and there's another thought here that we want this energy here to be greater than hc divided by lambda. So we want the energy to be at least 755 uh, or 7.56 times 10 to the minus 19 joules or greater. And so then when we um, calculate our wavelength, we're going to want it, or the, the lambda. In fact, I'm kind of butchering this real quick. Let's think about the sign real quick being, let's think of, how, of it this way. We want hc over lambda to be greater than or equal to 7.56 times 10 to the minus 19 joules, just to make sure I get this like greater than sign right. And so then when I flip it, when I flip the equation to solve and do the rearranging to solve for the wavelength, then the wavelength, lambda, I don't know why my, oh, I was using a highlighter. So my lambda comes out to be less than or equal to um, hc, divide by 7.56 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So we're going to find the wavelength. It has to be that or lower to be higher energy. And so I can take H 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. And that's on the equation sheet. If you forget it, the speed of light's also on the sheet. So times 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And then the joules cancel. Everything but meters cancels here. And I get 2.63 times 10 to the minus 7. Then I convert that to nanometers. And that's 263 nanometers. So we want that wavelength to be less than 263. OK. so. Photoelectric effect is one photon causes one event. We want the photon to contain the proper amount of energy for the transition or greater. Um, so as long as we're at a greater energy, now energy is hc over lambda. So if we're looking at E is equal to hc over lambda, if we want the energy to be higher, we need the wavelength to be lower due to that inverse relationship. So that's why we want to be lower than 263. If we go higher than 263, that's a, going to a lower energy. So if a laser emits 525 kJs per mole, what's the wavelength of this light? This is kind of like the same problem that we just looked at. So, um, so a laser, 525 kilojoules per mole of photons. Well, what about one photon? What's the energy in joules for just one photon? And then we can use hc over lambda again to find the wavelength associated with that amount of energy. And so we would just take 5. 25 kJs per mole. Use Avogadro's number again. So mole of anything, so mole of photons, would just be an Avogadro's number of photons. So 6.022 times 10 to the 23 photons times one photon for the energy of just a single photon. And then joules to kJs again. It's kind of too similar of a problem from the one we just did. So that's 8.72 times 10 to the minus 19. And then we just use HC over lambda again. And we solve for the, the lambda.
And so this is, you know, if we can go through and solve it the exact same way we solved for the previous lambda above, we could also go to the idea that, well, 455 kJs was 263. This is slightly higher energy, so this should be a little lower than 463. So this is probably 228 would be my guess. You know, so just thinking we're like a little bit higher in energy, so a little bit lower than 263. And if we wanted to solve for it, we're just plugging into this equation just like we previously had done. Okay, let's move on to number four. So number four is talking about copper uh, must absorb radiation. That's 1.15 times 10 to the 15 hertz. That's inverse seconds is all that this means here. And so then for an electron to be ejected, what wavelengths of light can cause this ejection of an electron? Question four is this actually asking us to convert the frequency to a lambda. So it's giving us the frequency for the transition and wants the wavelength. So this question here is really just saying convert 1.15 times 10 to the 15 hertz into the wavelength associated with that transition. So we're just asking here, what's the wavelength? So here we're just going to use C is equal to lambda times nu, the speed of light equation. And so then we know the speed of light. We know the frequency here, so we can solve for lambda. Two point nine nine eight times ten to the eight meters per second, and we'll divide by the frequency of one point one five times ten to the plus fifteen inverse seconds. And so the seconds cancel. We're leaving meters here. If I get two sixty one, two point six one times 10 to the minus 7 meters, and then the same conversion over to nanometers. So that's 261 nanometers. And so again, if we want to be at this frequency or higher, then we need to be at this wavelength or lower. So we need to be at 261 or lower to use that photoelectron effect. So photoelectric effect is all about the frequencies and the wavelengths being the proper value. Sometimes you're asked, well, what if we use a frequency lower than this but a higher intensity? The intensity of the light source doesn't really help because we don't have the photons with enough energy to cause any of the events to take place. So it doesn't matter if you use a gazillion photons or one photon, you're not going to get the transition to take place. So the intensity of light is usually a, a choice sometimes you see in a test that's something that doesn't help the event take place. Changing the, the frequency to be higher, changing the wavelength to be lower, allows the energy to be higher, then allows events to take place according to the photoelectric effect. So the conclusions derived from which theories uh, apply to an electron supports the use of probability distributions or orbitals for the locations of electrons in multi-electron atoms. So this is referring to the quantum mechanical model um, this is referring to maybe the use of quantum numbers or the use of things like uh, electron configurations, 1s2, 2s2, et cetera. And so those are coming from um, the uh, Schrodinger equation. So that's one word you might see is like the Schrodinger equation. I spell it right. I think I'm still butchering it. Schrodinger is one name. But he was draw Schrodinger was drawing on the results from the the Broglie wavelength and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So from the Bohr model, the Bohr model, like we were talking earlier, was just the electron orbiting a nucleus. It didn't really know how the electron was orbiting. It didn't know how it really was transitioning from one orbital to the next. Um, it just was being able to describe the energies that we saw in the hydrogen emission spectrum with a little bit more detail from the Balmer equation. If you remember, the Balmer equation was the first equation we saw relating to the hydrogen emission spectrum. Um, so to Berkeley wavelength, again, this is being the, the, the wave-like behavior of electrons for small particles, Heisenberg, then the uncertainty of the location. This was leading to the concept of orbitals through the Schrodinger equation. So it was the, the Broglie wavelength, the wave-like behavior, 
and then the uncertainty of the position, the electron cloud model that we get from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that then was feeding into that quantum mechanical model that we now know and use um, to model multi-electron atoms. So the um, Bohr model um, really wasn't, you know, I saw one source that said really the only thing you take away from the Bohr model is it gets the energies right from like the n equals one to n equals two to n equals three. So it gets the energies right, but doesn't really give a good picture of what's going on with the atom. Um, the Schrodinger equation, the orbitals that we use, those give a better description um, for multi-electron atoms. Okay, so moving on to number six, just the connection between n, l, m sub l values. Just remember, n can be any value starting one on upward in integral values. Another, I think, important part of Bohr model is seeing the quantized nature of matter, too. Um, so just seeing that things like n are quantized in whole number of values on upward. L can be up to, and starting from zero, but up to n minus one, integers up to n minus one. M sub L is the minus the L value through zero to plus L, all integers between. And then M sub S is either plus or minus a half. And so the N value is relating to the shell, and N and an L together relate to a subshell. If we specify all three, that's relating to an orbital within you know, some subshells relating to a specific orbital. And then the M sub S, these are getting at the actual, if we think of all four co combined together, are referring to a specific electron in an atom, where each electron has to have a unique set of those four quantum numbers. That's the Pauli exclusion principle. OK, so when N is 3, M sub L is minus 2, what is a possible value for the L value for that, what we would think of as like an orbital? So we're specifying an N, an M sub L, thinking of what the L value can be. This is referring to a particular orbital. So we're thinking, well, what's the combination of the NL and M sub L values here? And so the idea would be if M sub L is minus 2 and the N is 3, the only possible value of L for that orbital would be 2. So the L would have to be equal to 2. And that's because if L was 0 or L was 1, the range of M sub L if L is 0 is just 0. The range of M sub L if L is 1 is minus 1, 0, 1. The only time we can have an M sub L of minus 2 is if the L is 2. So when we're thinking of our combination, if, you know, if we say N is equal to 3, L is equal to, say, 1, then the range of M sub L is only minus 1, 0, plus 1. No minus 2 value. OK, so it gets into the discussion that the, the M sub L is limited by the specific L value for that particular orbital that that electron is falling into. And so the only possible L value here is 2. Now, if you were looking at answer A and thinking, well, why isn't it A? That's the range of possible L values when N is 3, but those, all three of those values don't have the possible M sub L of minus 2. Only the L value of 2 has the M sub L of minus 2. Now, the range of the M sub Ls, if we're looking at the range of the M sub L values, however many there are for a particular L value, tell you the number of orbitals. So this is how we're getting one S orbital because um, S is L0, only M sub L is 0. The, uh, when L is 1, that's the S. Or excuse me, uh, when L is 1, that's the, the, the P subshell. And the range of M sub L is minus 1, 0, 1, that's the 3P orbitals. When L is 2, that's D. Minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, that's 5. So we get 5D orbitals. 7 for F when L is 3, et cetera. OK, so. Um, Probably too many questions on this packet on the photoelectric effect. So we're, another one here on sodium, 496 kJs per mole, and a similar experiment to you know, Hertz's experiment. Which one, uh, uh, which statement is true about sodium being ionized? And so this one here, again, I don't think we need to work through it, because unless 496 nanometers happens to be 496 kJs per mole, which the process would be take 496 kJs per mole to the energy from one atom, Take that energy and calculate it into wavelength, um, and then you're going to see that that wavelength is going to be 241. And I think you could probably guess that would be the case, that, that if you start thinking about energies, that like over about 400 kJs per mole is starting to get into the UV region. If you remember, we're talking about UV photons being most damaging to, um, to, to human life. 
and life in general. And so when we're getting energies sort of beyond about 400 kJs per mole is getting into that ultraviolet region. So we could have imagined here that this should be a UV photon. And so that would be the 241 nanometer photon. And so we want to be at wavelengths of 241 or lower. Okay, so let's move on from the photoelectric effect on to the next question. So which of the following transitions in the H atom would emit a photon of the longest wavelength? So the longest wavelength would be the lowest energy. This being a longer wavelength goes to a lower energy. And so this question here is just kind of getting at the idea that our orbitals from N1, or not really our orbitals, our energy levels from N1 to N2 to N N3 are dropping in energy, then N4 is even lower, N equals five even lower. So our energy levels are getting closer together as we excite upward. And so we should have a lower energy being emitted when we're going from like a four to three compared to say a two to one. A two to one's a greater energy, so it should have a shorter wavelength. Something like a four to three transition or a five to four transition would result in having a longer wavelength. So when we're looking here, so which of the following transitions of the H atom would emit a photon? So we get emission when we go from high N to low N. So we get emission when we go from high N to low N, and then we have to have absorption when we do the opposite. If we want to go from low to high, if we want to go from a one to two, this is absorption. And if we want to go from two to one, that would be emission. So we emit a photon, high to low, we have to absorb a photon or energy to go from low to high. And so we're looking from not low to high, but we're looking from high to low. And so four to three is going to have the lower energy difference compared to the four to one. So this one's going to have a shorter wavelength. This one here will have a longer wavelength. So here we're just looking at the relative energy differences of the H atom to answer a question like this last one on this page here. Okay, so uh, we could calculate the energies too. Like we could always go to the Bohr model. I'm not going to, to, to bore you guys with that calculation, but we could plug in the values into the, the Bohr model equation to calculate the specific wavelengths. But we would expect this one to be UV region. This one here would actually be in the IR infrared region. If we're thinking about, we did a problem like that in, in, in our notes. So just another example of why the four to three lower energy than that UV photon, four to one. Okay, so then uh, what's a possible magnetic quantum number for an electron in a 3p orbital? Um, I don't know if we would test you on the nomenclature of the orbitals. Usually we would say the magnetic quantum number. This is, um, if we think of the, the, this is the m sub l quantum number. The, uh, the n value is the principal quantum number. L is the angular momentum quantum number. Okay, so we're, uh, what are the possible m sub l values for a 3p orbital? So for the 3p, n is equal to 3, l is equal to 1. And so the possible values, or a possible value for the m sub l would be that it would be either minus 1, 0, or plus 1. So it would be one of those three values. So it could be 0, but it couldn't be minus 2, couldn't be 3. The m sub s, the magnetic spin quantum number, could be plus or minus a half. So the only possible value there would be zero. What is the range of angular momentum quantum numbers? So this is the L value. When, uh, oh, so it actually tells us here. So what are the range of the angular momentum quantum numbers L uh, when N is equal to four? So when N is equal to four, L could be equal to zero, one, two, or three, up to N minus one. So it can't be four because the max L can be is n minus one. It also has to start at zero. And so C looks like the range of all possible m sub L values that would be possible for an orbital in the n equals four shell. So C is wrong, but it looks like the m sub L range that's possible uh, for that entire shell. And then of course it can't be just only three in answer B. Which atom below contains the greatest number of unpaired electrons? 
So unpaired electrons would be coming from, or thinking about the um, electron configuration. So let's just kind of look at um, sulfur first. If we notice, the, this is in the, the, the 3S, the, the 3P block of elements. So these configurations here are all 3S2 on top of a neon. Neon 3S2 and then 3P, you know, sulfur would be 3P6. Or excuse me, not 3P6, 3P4. So sulfur is four across. And so our diagram would look like our one 3S orbital, two electrons, and I have the three P orbitals. I go one, two, three, and then four. So I apply Hund's rule. Hund's rule is use and maximize the spin and all the orbitals in the subshell that are equal in energy. And so I have my three P4 with four electrons, two of them spin paired in the same direction. And so I have two unpaired electrons for sulfur. If I go to phosphorus, that's only the P3 configuration, so I have to kick an electron out. So I remove this electron here. And so then I have three unpaired electrons for phosphorus. Silicon is like sulfur, it only has two. So silicon is the P2 configuration. So I kick another electron out here. So that would be silicon's diagram. So it would have two unpaired electrons. And then chlorine is the 3P5. So we go back and add a couple electrons. So we just have one. So the most unpaired electrons here is for phosphorus. And so here we just have to come up with the electron configuration and then come up with the diagram using Hund's rule maximizing the spin of electrons. And so if we were looking at a diagram of phosphorus that looked like this for our 3P, if we were looking at a diagram that looked like this, excuse me, let's stop here. So this diagram here would violate Hund's rule. So this would be the wrong configuration for phosphorus. If we had another one that looked like this, that would violate the Pauli exclusion principle because then these two electrons would share the same set of quantum numbers. And so the proper configuration for phosphorus, again, would be the one where we use all three of the p orbitals with one electron each. We're then told for palladium has an anomalous configuration of krypton 44. How many total unpaired electrons does the atom have? Well, the anomalous is coming from the idea that we would have expected it to be krypton 5s2 48. This is our expected configuration. Um, but then it has this anomaly. We're told it has the 4D10 configuration. So in a 4D10, we're just putting 10 electrons into the D subshell. All of them spin paired. So we'd have zero unpaired electrons. If we wanted to, if we were asked, well, what would, how many would we expect in the configuration that we expected, then we'd have the 5S2 and then the 4D8. So we would have expected two unpaired electrons. So the properties of an atom are greatly different when you have unpaired electrons. Unpaired electrons makes the atom magnetic. No unpaired electrons makes the atom not magnetic. So you change the magnetic property of the atom just to show you that the electron pair has some relevance in terms of the behavior of the atom. Um, then for 14, what ground state configuration do we uh, expect for neodymium? Um, and so, so neodymium is in the um, F block. It's in the 4F block, the first of those. And so it's element number 60. Sometimes it's helpful to just look at the element number because then we go to the preceding noble gas is xenon, which is 54 electrons. And then after xenon, we come to the uh, sixth row. So it should be a 6S2. And if you're not sure it's a 6S, if you're like, is it a 5S, is it a 7S? One, you can just go to the row above to xenon would be the fifth row, so rubidium, strontium. Hydrogen's a 1S, lithium's a 2S, sodium's a 3S, potassium's a 4S, rubidium's a 5S, so cesium would be a 6S. So we go 6S2, and then we go into the F block. We go into the F block because that's the next block, seven elements, or, or um, um, 14 elements across the F block. Neodymium is just the fourth across. Now, if you're looking here, does it look like the third across? This periodic table is a little confusing because the first one is lanthanum that's shown up in what looks like the D block, and then we get the next three. 
So how we make sure we get this count right here is one, if you look at your periodic table, I think it makes more sense than when you get on your exam. So the, I think the exam periodic table is a little easier to use. But we go plus two, and then we have to have four here to get to 60. So we have to have 60 electrons assigned for the atom, which is element number 60. So you have to match here in terms of your total electron count. So that'll help you make sure that you get the right electron count. So we have a 6s2, 4f4. Okay, this is going to some chapter four uh, review topics. So uh, no real equations on the exam from chapter four. The only equations that are like kind of summarized and the only key ones at the end of the chapter are that molarity is moles solute over volume of solution. So just making sure we get that we're putting moles of whatever the solute is divided by the volume of uh, solution. And just to kind of throw out to one key problem sometimes that you see, if we say you have 1.0 molar like K2SO4, like K2SO4 in water isn't really K2SO4, it's really 2K plus in a sulfate. And so just right off the bat, you can sort of see that the K plus concentration would be 2.0 moles per liter, and the sulfate ion concentration would be equal to 1.0 molar. Just to kind of get a sense of the moles of the actual solutes here would be potassium ions and sulfate ions. So if you have one mole of K2SO4 in a liter solution, you have two moles of K plus ions, and you have one mole of sulfate ion. Um, and then also just remember that these polyatomic ions stay intact. The polyatomic ions aren't dissociating into any kind of other ions like sulfide and oxide or anything crazy like that. We remain intact with sulfate. Then the dilution equation is this one here. Um, M concentrated, V concentrated equals M dilute, V dilute, or M1V1 equals M2V2, or I think I called it MIVI equals MFVF for just changing the concentrations of solutions. Okay, so this question here is saying you have an aqueous solution of HNO3, strong electrolyte, therefore excellent conductor of electricity in solution. Which of the following diagrams um, depicts the particles in solution? Um, it says for clarity, water has been emitted. And so what we're looking for is you know, H plus ions and NO3 minus ions because this is a strong acid. It should completely ionize into its constituent H plus ions and nitrate ions. And so that looks like box one. So we see our H plus and our nitrates broken apart. So that's good. Um, box two looks like, this looks like a weak acid. This looks like you have, we have partial um, dissociation. And so if we had something like HNO2 or HF or some kind of weak acid, that's what box two would be representing. Um, box three would be representing a non-electrolyte. So if we had something that didn't dissociate at all in solution, that's what box three looks like, something like methanol. Methanol in solution doesn't dissociate at all, might look something like box three. And then box four is probably what you might think um, HNO3 looks like if it went to N3 minus and O2 minus ions, which it doesn't do. And so four is like complete ionization of the polyatomic ions, which is not how the polyatomic ions behave in solution. Nitrate's stable, stays intact, it's good by itself. Okay, so on that one, box one was the one H plus and nitrate ions in the box. So question two, uh, which reaction leads to the formation of precipitate? So this is kind of following along with the solubility chart. So we're just kind of thinking here, do we do a metathesis reaction? We get copper um, hydroxide. And so the question, is that AQ or solid? That's insoluble in water. Um, so that would be a solid. And then the other product would be calcium chloride, which is uh, AQ, water soluble. And so we do get a precipitate with A. What about B? Sodium carbonate, calcium nitrate. Um, calcium carbonate, is that water soluble? Or is it, is it AQ or solid? It would be solid. So calcium is only soluble uh, for ammonium in the alkali cations, but not for calcium. Um, if you remember, if you could look at the solubility chart that's on the test for chapter four, the solubility charts on the test, hydroxide sulfide ions would allow calcium to be soluble when paired up with it, but not carbonate ion. And then our other product here would be sodium nitrate, which is an AQ. So we get um, a precipitate in, in, in B, 
What about C? We'd get calcium sulfate. So sulfates are generally soluble with four exceptions. The exceptions on our chart are mercury one ion, lead two plus, strontium, barium, but not calcium. And so this would be an AQ, water soluble. And then our other product would be iron iodide. So we don't change the charge state. So we're saying iron two plus FeI two. Iodides, chlorides, and bromides, so the halide ions, the three of them, are soluble, but with only three exceptions. The exception silver, uh, lead, and mercury one. Okay, so that's an AQ as well. So we don't get precipitate in C. So only A and B lead to precipitate formation. So how do we assign the electrolytic behavior of the compounds in number three? So iron carbonate is insoluble. Let's actually go back real quick. So there's something I've heard a few times. Um, so if I, if I were to say this statement, all ionic compounds are soluble in water, that's incorrect, right? Because it's all water soluble ionic compounds are strong electrolytes. So if an ionic compound's water soluble, it ionizes in water. If the compound's insoluble in water, it doesn't ionize at all, it doesn't enter water, it just stays behind. So insoluble for um, iron carbonate, soluble, if we're just thinking of water solubility kind of first, insoluble for iron carbonate, soluble for KOH, soluble for zinc chloride, that's not one of the exceptions for the usual soluble chloride ion. Sulfides are usually insoluble, silver's not an exception, so that's insoluble. Nitrates are all soluble, so that's a soluble compound. HG2I2, we gotta be a little careful with mercury, HGI2 is soluble because that's mercury two, but HG2I2 is insoluble. Because this is HG2 two plus, that's the exception. The regular HG2 plus ion is not one of the exceptions. We just have to be careful that the exceptions that are insoluble for chloride, bromide, uh, iodide, and for sulfate are HG2 two plus. So if we're looking specifically at mercury, it's HG where we have two of them with a two plus charge and then not HG2+. So we just have one mercury ion with a two plus charge, that's not one of the exceptions. Okay, so this is the insoluble exception, so that's insoluble. Rubidium is an alkali metal, all alkali metals are soluble, that's one of the exceptions for sulfite, so that's soluble. And so then all of the soluble compounds are strong electrolytes. So all of the soluble compounds are strong electrolytes in water. All the insoluble compounds are not any kind of electrolyte in the solution. So I have four compounds that are strong electrolytes. That looks like answer B. So spectator ions are the ions that are unchanged during the course of a reaction. And so when we look at phosphoric acid, when we're trying to break apart a reaction into its ionic reaction, we, we're just trying to ask the question or address, is the compound a strong electrolyte? H3PO4 is not a strong acid, so we don't break it apart. We leave this as 2H3PO4 if we're trying to ionize the reaction, but then calcium hydroxide is a strong electrolyte. So our strong electrolytes are things like water-soluble ionic compounds and then strong acids. So strong acids are molecular compounds. If we're molecular but a strong acid, then we would completely dissociate the compound in our ionic reaction. So three calcium ions, six hydroxide ions dissociating. And now we have an insoluble compound. And then we also have so we have this is not this is not an electrolyte because it's insoluble, and water is a non-electrolyte, meaning it doesn't. I mean, it dissociates a tiny fraction of it dissociates to H plus and OH minus ions, but it's like less than ten to the minus five percent. So that's so little that we call it a non-electrolyte. So non-electrolyte for water, uh, certainly not a strong electrolyte. And so we only dissociate strong electrolytes into our ionic equation. So none of the products can be dissociated into the ionic equation. So meaning there are no spectator ions present. So no spectator ions for that reaction. 
So the spectator ions would have to be in their ionic form on the left and right side in exactly the same form. So when um, HNO3, which is an acid, reacts with K2S, a gas is formed, what type of reaction um, can be said to have occurred? Let's write out what happens. HNO3, AQ, um, K2S, AQ. Uh, we're going to do the acid base kind of switching, like metathesis reaction. So we're going to form H2S. So two H pluses with the S2 minus. This is the gas that forms, and this floats away from the solution. And the byproduct would be KNO3, AQ. And so then we'd have to balance this reaction, two KNO3s, two HNO3s. Now this would be an acid-base reaction. So we have an acid and a base forming what looks like a salt instead of water here, H2S. So this is a, looks like a metathesis reaction, but we have an acid-base reaction forming H2S. Now let's, like, um, let's then say, well, what if we were asked about spectator ions in this equation? So what about this equation for the spectator ions. Well, HNO3 is a strong electrolyte, so we dissociate it. 2H plus plus 2 nitrate. K2S is also a strong electrolyte, so it's 2K plus plus S2 minus. And then H2S is a non electrolyte, that's why it's a gas and floats away. So we leave H2S intact. And then KNO3, we can dissociate 2K plus plus two NO3 minus. And so the spectator ions would be nitrate in exactly the same form and K plus. So the spectators here would be NO3 minus. Those are our spectator ions. And so we could cancel those out for the net ionic equation. So the net ionic equation for this reaction would be two H plus plus an S2 minus going to H2S. So just an example of writing a net ionic reaction and then identifying the spectator ions in the process. What is the molar concentration of chloride in 2.0 MFeCl2? Well, let's just, I mean, we kind of talked about this on the first start of chapter four here, but this would be 2.0 moles of FeCl2 per liter of solution. And then FeCl2 dissociates. So this is really for the chloride ion concentration. Just a simple one mole of FeCl2 would form two moles of Cl minus. So that's iron two chloride. So we just release the chloride ion into the solution. And so that would be 4.0 molar chloride. The total ion concentration, if we were asked the total concentration of ions, well, we'd have four moles per liter chloride plus one mole per liter iron. So we'd have five molar total ions in solution. Sometimes we're asked about conductivity. A solution that contains fewer ions is less conductive. A solution that contains more total ions is more conductive. So you could see that, like, let's say we had a solution of, um, um, uh, what's a good one? Yeah, like uh, say iron three sulfate. So Fe2SO4-3 is water soluble. So if you had a 2.0 molar solution of this, then you'd have five moles of ions in solution. That would have more ions than 2.0 molar iron chloride. So this solution here would be higher in conductivity. So there's some questions that related to conductivity because this is dissociating into iron and sulfate, but two irons and, and three sulfates. So you can think about one mole of compound dissociating. You have to think how a mole of compound might have fewer or more ions per mole than other compounds based on the formula. Let's look at oxidation numbers. So we have to know where to start an oxidation number problem. Like we know calcium can only be a two plus charge, two plus oxidation number. Oxygen's usually a minus two with some exceptions. The exceptions are peroxides, superoxides, and compounds with fluorine. Peroxides and superoxides are only forming when O is paired up with alkali metals and occasionally alkaline metals, but nothing else. Maybe hydrogen for hydrogen peroxide, but that's about it. Um, and so then 
for oxygen, we should be able to spot when it's one of the exceptions because it'll look something like Li2O2 and we'll spot the alkali metal. I know that this might not be oxygen in its normal state, but we know lithium's a plus one, plus two. So this is O2 with a minus two charge, so that's peroxide ion. And that's each O with an oxidation number of minus one. So that's one of the exceptions for O. But we can see that Cr2O7, that's not one of the exceptions. It's just ordinary minus two O. So we go minus 14, plus two for the one calcium. I have to have a plus 12 for chromium. There's two of them, so it's plus six for each chromium. So that's chromium plus six, oxidation state in CaCr2O7. Uh, now the other exception for O is when we pair it up with F. So if you have like O2F, F goes minus, um, let me actually change this to OF2 is a more common compound. So um, OF2, we minus two for the two Fs and then plus two for the O. So O can go positive when paired up with fluorine. In other words, fluorine stays negative with everything. O adjusts positive. Um, if you have something like ClF3, again, the fluorine stays negative. Three of them minus three, so it's chlorine with a plus three. So one last oxidation number rule would be something like ClO2 minus for like the chloride ion. Oxygen, just ordinary minus two. Two of them minus four. We have to sum up to minus one, so chlorine's a plus three. So chlorine goes positive, oxygen stays negative. So it's kind of telling you the preference that F stays negative, O goes positive, and then O stays negative with everything else other than F. Now we can use oxidation numbers to figure out which atoms are oxidized or reduced. ClO2, minus two for O, minus four, so that's plus four for um, chlorine. Water's plus one for H, minus two for O. HClO3, plus one for H, minus two for the O's, minus six, plus one, so that's a plus five for chlorine and then H plus one, chlorine minus one. So hydrogen's plus one on both sides of the reaction. All the oxygens are minus two on both sides of the reaction. Chlorine's the only atom changing. So chlorine, some of them go to plus five, and then some of them go to plus one. And so chlorine plus four to plus five is losing electrons, so this is the oxidation step, because we lost an electron in that transition. And then the plus four to plus one, this is gaining electrons. That's the reduction. So chlorine is both oxidized and reduced in the reaction. So chlorine's the atom undergoing both the oxidation and the reduction in this reaction. So again, oxidation is gaining electrons. <laughs> I just said it wrong. Oxidation is the act of losing electrons. So losing electrons is oxidation. Gaining electrons is reduction. So Leo, the line goes Gur or oil rig or how these can be hopefully remembered. Um, so what is the balance ion net ionic equation when iron sulfate and KOH are mixed together? So the net ionic equation, if we're thinking here, this is completely water soluble, KOH is water soluble. So if we're thinking of our reaction here, we'd be writing um, 2Fe3 plus plus 3SO4, 2 minus, kind of jumping right into the ionic equation, plus K plus, plus OH minus, goes to um, K2SO4 is going to be water soluble, but then iron hydroxide, FeOH3, is insoluble in water. So that's our precipitate formation is the FeOH3, and then K2, so K plus and SO4, 2 minus stay in solution. So we're going to have to do a little balancing here. But the things that are changing, or, or excuse me, not changing, are sulfate and the K plus. And so our net ionic equation is going to be two iron three plus plus six hydroxide ion go to two FeOH three, and we can divide by two here for each of those to go to Fe3 plus plus three hydroxide ion goes to FeOH3. So that's the net ionic equation. We've canceled out the spectator ions. So the spectator ions 
or what we've canceled. Um, the last question here, last page, um, let me make a quick video and I'll post that after class so we're not rushing here at the end. So I'll just make a quick video and post those along with the lecture slot. I'll post those as an additional video on a separate video so you can easily get to those after class. But those are going to get at dilution equations and some stoichiometry problems. Okay, so that's our review for the exam. Good luck tonight and I'll see you guys back here on Wednesday. Hello, these are the solutions to the final three problems from our review packet. So um, the last problem from this page here is a chemist adds 0.15 moles of lithium chloride to a 250 milliliter volumetric flask, fills to the mark with water, assuming that all the solid dissolves. We then pipette four mils of that solution into then a 50 milliliter volumetric flask and want to know the concentration of lithium chloride in the final 50 milliliter flask. And so let's do the first first flask first. So our concentration lithium chloride in, let's call that the first flask, would be 0 0.15 moles, and we're dividing that by a 0 0.250 liter flask, because that was our total volume of solution, so that is going to be 0 0.60 molar lithium chloride. And then if we take four milliliters of this solution here, So I do 0 0.004 liters, because that's four milliliters, times that concentration. That's how many moles of lithium chloride I've transferred to the new flask, and the new flask is 0 0.050 liters. So our lithium chloride solution in our solution two would be 0 0.04 times 0 0.6 divided by 0 0.05, or 0 0.004, sorry times 0.6 divided by 0.05, it's 0 0.048. Now for this step here, I was really just using the concept of molarity as moles over volume. You could also have done M1V1 equals M2V2, so an approach could have been taking four milliliters times 0 0.60 molar to use like MIVI equals MFVF, and so this is our MI and VI equals MF as our unknown times VF of 50 milliliters, and we get to the same answer. Moving on to the final page. Write and balance the reaction between aluminum metal and nitric acid. Um, so they do react together. So aluminum plus HNO3. We'll go to AlNO3. 3 is our salt, water soluble, plus uh, H2 gas is the byproduct. I wouldn't worry a whole lot about this reaction here, other than we have the 0 going to 3 plus, that's aluminum being oxidized, and the H plus to H0 being reduced. To balance this, we're going to do, let's do a 2 here, a 2 here a six here and a three here. And so um, let's imagine also that we give you the reaction. So we'd probably be likely to give the reaction if we want to ask this problem on a test. But then um, how much aluminum metal, so how much, excuse me, HNO3 in liters is needed to fully dissolve 27 grams of aluminum? Well, let's just do this with dimensional analysis. 27 grams of aluminum. That's approximately the molar mass of aluminum. For every two moles of aluminum, we need to add six moles of HNO3. And the concentration we have here is 0 0.50 moles of HNO3 per liter of that solution. So that looks like three divided by half. That's going to be six liters. I'm going to take six liters of that acid solution. And then our final question.
consider the metathesis reaction between silver nitrate and calcium chloride. We have a mole of each reacting. What are the molarities of all the ions present in the solution once the reaction is complete? So the reaction taking place is AgNO3, Aq, plus CaCl2, Aq going to AgCl. That's our insoluble salt driving the reaction, and then calcium nitrate. And this is an AQ for the calcium nitrate. And so um, I don't know if this helps to think of the ionic reaction, but this is water soluble. That's water soluble. This is not water soluble. This is water soluble. So calcium and nitrate are the spectator ions. They're the things that are present in ionic form on both sides of the equation. And then silver and chloride are the ions being dissociated. Now we have one mole of each of these is what one liter times one molar gives us. And so I think we can see that if we consume all the calcium chloride, we would need two moles of silver nitrate, but we don't have two moles of silver nitrate. So the silver nitrate here becomes the limiting reactant. And so for every two moles of silver nitrate, we need to react half of the calcium chloride. And so half of the calcium chloride reacts, leaving the other half of it behind. And so all of my silver nitrate reacts, half of the calcium chloride reacts, but all the nitrate and all the calcium remain in solution anyways, and then only the silver ion goes to zero. So the silver ion goes to zero. So I have one mole of nitrate ion. The, so my concentration of nitrate is unchanged here. So I had one mole of it initially present. That's the same concentration finally present. Two liters of solution, that's half molar. Calcium ion is also you know, not changing. So I have one mole of calcium initially present, and I have two liters of solution. And then I have precipitated half of my chloride, and I have half of a mole of calcium chloride remaining. Well, there's two chlorides per mole, so that's one mole of chloride. So I have one mole of chloride remaining, two liters of solution, it's half molar as well. So all these other ions are at half molar. So the two types of problems to expect on the test for stoichiometry are ion concentration problems like the final question here, or just basic stoichiometry problems like the one above.